morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom. Today, we welcome Jay Stelnacker. He is the technical lead for Wildfire for the X Prize Group. So, welcome to the show, Jay. Hello. Hello. You have a very long history in fighting wildfires. So, 27 years as a smoke jumper. Could you explain what a smoke jumper is and your history? Yeah. yeah. So not all, not, not all not 27, 27 years, years as a ju- jumper, that, that would uh, almost be impossible. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so I started at a young age um, uh, as a volunteer fireman um, here in Colorado and quickly um, became passionate about it, uh, about serving others and helping and giving back to the community um, that turned into full-time jobs, uh, working for both local government and the U.S. Forest Service that turned into uh, having an opportunity to go smoke jump uh, out of of Idaho and Montana for the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, And then I returned back to Boulder here where I was the uh, fire management officer for Boulder County. um, And I built the wildland fire department uh, and the program here that exists today. Um, Retired about uh, five years ago, six years ago. thought I'd just be on the river fly fishing uh, and um, a couple opportunities came up and more recently the XPRIZE uh, Foundation opportunity came up and and that's where I landed. Uh, During that time, you know, I served as a a type one operation section chief on the type one teams, um, incident commander, um, multiple roles. I was a commissioned police officer, SWAT officer. Uh, I've worked with, uh, you know, the FBI, um, Secret Service, um, hmm. the military, obviously, all on special projects, uh, been on some large, uh, terrible disasters, um, hurricanes, floods, fires, um, and, uh, and, and been able to take all that experience and hopefully, you know, make a little difference here with this X Prize competition in our work. Oh, I mean, you have a very long history and basically you're a disaster expert and it's not just, it's obviously not just wildfire. And I would assume working with the FBI and other military organizations, you have to have a level of calm and ability to manage anxiety because these are not easy places that you're, you're responding to or running into. Wow. That, that's interesting. Uh, I'll tell a funny story real quick. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, there's three ways to manage stress, right. In crisis, right. You know, fight, flight, freeze. Um, so, during t- when I started smoke jumping, my my best way to manage stress was to fall asleep. Uh, so we'd be on the jump plane, ready to be thrown out of the aircraft into the wildfire, and I'd be the only one sleeping on the plane. So uh, you know, I, I, my body really does. It, the human body has an amazing capacity to adjust to stress, and really identifying and understanding where your body's at at any one point in time um, during those crisis situations is the first step. Right. Because you, you can't yeah. control a lot of it. Right. And a lot of it, it's it's uh, physiological, uh, psychological. So, you know, there's a lot that's that's uncontrollable. But awareness is a key. So, yeah, I was taught early. Um, one of the things we do good in crisis disaster management and leadership is is train folks, uh, our leaders, our followers uh, to manage crisis and disaster physically and understand what it's doing to your body, know your pulse rate. You know, I could sit at a table mm-hmm. and I, I could tell you what my pulse rate is right now. Um, and that's just because you have to be that in tune with your body. Now, with that all said, I've made my share of mistakes and uh, had my share of outbursts and uh, breakdowns and um, things I'm not proud of, but uh, you know, they all made me who I am today and, and it, it all worked eventually. You know, it, it brought me to, uh, to become a, a decent leader in disaster crisis management. I, I would say you're probably more than just a decent leader in crisis disaster management. Um, that being said, that when you and I were talking um, with respect to wildfires and wildfire management, a lot of thing, a lot of the methodologies that we're using today are not exactly designed for what we're seeing now with mega fires and the, the speed that we're seeing wildfires. So one thing that people love to talk about, prescribed burn. It's a good thing. But it's not, we don't exactly have enough time to address all of the issues out there with that one methodology. It was a good conversation we had on this. You know, I am a a huge proponent of prescribed fire. In fact, I've put more prescribed fire in the landscape here in northern Colorado than any other fire manager. Um, And um, I truly believe in its its benefit to the ecosystem and to also the 
reduction of fuels, which ultimately results in, you know, a little bit but lower intensity fire. The yeah. problem is, is we have, a, as we discussed, the situation currently in our forests and our urban interface that um, the fuel loading's too much. The, um, the climate has changed. The temperatures are different. Uh, drought is more consistent. The seasons blend together easier. Oh, yeah. And other, other hurdles, uh, for example, here in Colorado, which, which I'm not criticizing, are, are air quality issues. Um, you know, that's a big trade-off. Uh, we have a sensitive, what we call airshed here in Colorado and many other parts of the state where pollution is, is really killing us, you know, no pun intended, but it is. And, you know, to put a prescribed fire on the ground and add to that problem is not good. It, it doesn't make anybody happy. And so there's, there's all these challenges around prescribed fire that I've always said it gives fire managers an excuse not to burn. Yeah. It's easy not to burn, right? It's really easy because nobody's going to say, well, why didn't you burn stuff? Everybody's going to say, oh, thank you for not burning. That could have been dangerous. So you have to, you know, you have to realize that there's a time and a place for prescribed fire and it's not going to be the, the, the end solution for the wildfire problem. No, there's there's no one solution for the wildfire problem. We have to come up with many different things. And one of the things, um, the new technology that's being developed, because you know, you've told me that people have this perception in their head of a bright red shiny truck showing up, the firefighters coming out with their axes and their hoses and running into that fire. That's a terrible idea. That is how people get hurt. We have technology now. We should be using that technology to save the lives of our firefighters, but also the PTSD that they get. And we're going to talk more about um, one of the um, 501c3s that Jay's involved in. But um, the PTSD, most people don't realize the suicide rates are very high amongst first responders, higher than our veterans and soldiers, because they are the ones facing these disasters head on. And then the aftermath of, of people that they either rescued or couldn't rescue. So that is definitely something to think about. Um, and we will get into that. But first, I want to segue into XPRIZE and what XPRIZE does with you know these new technologies we desperately need. Um, could you start with what is XPRIZE in case people are not familiar and what you're working on with respect to wildfire? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an exciting time. You know, the XPRIZE Foundation is a nonprofit. Um, it's almost 30 years old uh, as we speak today. Our first competition was the Ansari Prize, which was to encourage private space flight uh, by offering a financial incentive, to be honest with you, money. Um, and we accomplished that. And from there, we've had almost 30 other different large scale competitions focused around humanity's greatest crisis. This includes everything from feeding the population to yeah. protecting the coral reefs and the rainforest to now the role I'm in and the, the prize we're hosting is the wildfire competition. So really, again, it's about, you know, incentivizing innovators in technology specifically to come together and solve a problem that we as a community, a government, as, as a private sector haven't been able to do. And we're a safe space. You know, we don't have a political agenda. We don't have, um, Very we're agnostic to the solution. You know, we, we, we don't care what you come up with as long as you solve the problem. Um, and so that's, that's fun because it really does leave a lot of room for creativity and innovation, especially as you said, it, Technology is exponentially growing. Uh, I don't yeah. uh, at this rate, you know, what we learn today is going to be old by, you know, six months from now, as far as technology goes, well, yeah. it'll be. So, you know, unfortunately in wildfire and why we chose to focus on wildfire for this, this new competition is that we, we saw that technology was one of the gaps. Um, yeah. So the wildfire competition is focusing on introducing technology to detection, response and suppression. Yes, we could have chosen a bunch of other areas to focus on, but we really did find that there are a lot of great organizations, communities, individuals like yourself that are working on these other problems, community resilience, uh, prescribed fire, fuel planning and mitigation. There's a lot going on, but what's not going on is technology. It's yeah. not being introduced at a rate that it's, that it's, that's available to us. Um, so uh, I'll start. I'll continue if it's okay by sharing a story. My wife just sent me a picture from the internet and it was probably from the early 1900s of a fireman and a helmet that basically had 
water spraying all around him. And that was technology in the 1900s. And I will say that throughout the 1900s and all the way to 1960, we did embrace technology. We brought helicopters, we brought smoke jumpers, we brought heavy air tankers, we brought all this technology forward. But after the 60s, it all stopped. It stopped. We started just reinventing the same things. In other words, the aircraft got bigger, right? Um, you know, the, the equipment got bigger, more capable, but the technology was lost, the advancement. You know, I can't say why other than, you know, typical to any industry, culture, money, mm -hmm. politics, you know, all these other social, sh social pressure. And honestly, the one thing that we always, unfortunately, have to fall back on is we're in crisis mode. The last thing we have to focus on is advancements and introducing new technology. We're trying to save lives and homes and trees. And so that timing's not there. So the X Prize decided to fo focus on technology. We have two tracks. Hmm. Track A is a satellite based detection track. So what we're trying to do there is encourage innovators to either use new observational equipment, cameras, sensors, or existing observational data from space. Hmm to provide real time, if not real time observations that fire managers can use to manage fires, to make decisions about, hey, this is a good fire, let's let it burn and do some, some good stuff on the landscape. Or, hey, this is a bad fire, we need to get resources to it quicker. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, right now, you know, some problems with space-based uh, detection is the inability for the sensors to see through clouds and smoke. So you could see that be a big issue. <laughs> um, and, and also the latency, we call it. So that return rate of when we could get a new snapshot of that yeah. fire. You know, the best in class right now is 90 minutes. And that's if the satellite's in the right position, so on and so forth. Yeah, well, so, that's too know, late after 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, we're really trying to shrink that window down to 15 minutes and or real time. So. We do have audacious challenges. Some of our challenges have never been won at X Prize because they're so audacious, but some of them have, and they've made changes, you know, for humanity. Um, and we hope this one does. Track B in the wildfire competition is my favorite. It's the autonomous detection and response track, which includes suppression. So track B is really focused on the dangerous incipient stage fires. In other words, the fires that are small, but undetected and if let to grow or spread are gonna be devastating, destructive. Those are the ones we wanna stop. There's no good in any of those fires, right? There, there's nothing good they're gonna do. So in that tract, we're challenging competitors in under 10 minutes to detect a destructive, potentially spreading fire in its incipient stage, if that all made sense. <laughs> It's find it. So not only detect it, but locate it, meaning go get it, go find it, physically find it, and then put it out all in 10 minutes. minutes. So uh, we've seen some crazy technology already from our competitors. And I'm telling you, it's going to be fun. It's, it's going to be really fun. I, I like the fact it's a competition. Now, I am pulling some memory here, so I might be completely off, but I, re I think it was Virgin Galactic was the first yep. X Prize winner. Okay, so I got that yep. part right. And being a Richard Branson fan, like almost stalker crazy fan, I remember reading up on him and he said that um, he loved the X Prize idea because it gave people an incentive to invent. And he used the analogy with the Wright brothers. This is where I may get something wrong. He said the Wright brothers didn't just say we want to fly. There was a competition. And who can get in the air? And that's why they did it. So he kind of used that analogy of we need to get into space. Some people differ in that opinion, but we it was advancing the technology, advancing, getting people to work together, because you guys do encourage um, uh, collaborations of this tech. And the reason the tech, and I'm going to go into some data here, our wildfires or megafires as they're becoming, 60 to 80 miles an hour is what um, these things are roaring through areas. So it's not a slow moving fire. This is, this is a speeding car. And I think someone used the analogy of one football field a minute, I think is that analogy. So these are too fast. These, these are, you know, when you say you want response time in 10 minutes, it's not some grandiose lofty idea. This is reality. Yeah. We need to stop it in 10 minutes. Absolutely. And, and to your point, I mean, you know, I've done a lot of fire fatality investigations and been part of 
unfortunate incidents like that. And one thing that we often see is the exponential, use that word again, exponential growth of wildfire in the perception of the human brain, even as firemen and women, we are actually unable to perceive the rate of spread of a wildfire in its, its worst state. Um, think about that. Like your mind can't even process how fast it's moving. And so it's beyond 80, 90 miles an hour. It's so fast you can't even process it. And this is due to not just the wind, but the preheating of the fuels in front of it, the density and compactness of the fuels, meaning fuels, meaning trees and brush and homes. Um, it, it all just, you know, it, it exponentially just continues to grow and build. So you're right. I mean, if you cannot catch these fires, these dangerous, unwanted fires in that first 10 minutes, you're not going to catch them. You're not. There's no way to catch them. And that's that red, shiny fire truck analogy you started with. There is we we would never ask. You heard this before. But we would never ask our firemen, our police officers, our first responders to go hold hands on the beach when a hurricane's approaching Florida. Would we? Never. No, never. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? So why do we ask our firefighters, our public safety providers to stand in front of a wildfire that has just as much destructive capability as that hurricane? And yeah. that's where the disconnect with, you know, what we do in the field, what the community expects and what's truly possible. Yeah. And I mean, I love the analogy of the hurricane because it does give people an image of what well, we would never expect someone to do that. Why are you expecting a firefighter to run into a blaze? We have, we're working on technology. We have some pretty good technology. Um, but let's, now I want to really focus on your 501c3, which is the warriors on the river. And the PTSD that first responders had, I only learned this last year myself at the after the fire summit, uh, wildfire summit in Sonoma, that, P, that PTSD in first responders is higher than our veterans and soldiers and the suicide rates are higher. People need to understand that because there is so much, I mean, I, I can't even properly express it. I've never been in a fire myself. Could you explain what they feel? I mean, why, what are they going through when they're addressing these wildfires? Yeah, you know, personally I can. Um, you know, I remember the first fire I was on to this day. Um, and, and one thing about wildfire uh, is you're either gonna love it or hate it. Meaning when you're actually a practitioner of, of being a fireman or woman. And I loved it. It was like a drug. Couldn't get enough of it. Adrenaline, you know, running lights and sirens. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to deny there's some, uh, you know, excitement about that, that just builds in you and you get more excited and you start to lose your grasp on sort of the destruction around you. And as you progress through your career, two, two or three things happen to most, most of us. Um, one is it's very infrequent. So there's a lot of sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> and then there's a lot of life threatening activities, yeah. you know, meaning your life is threatened. And so those extremes themselves are the foundation of PTSD in some cases, because your mind is turning on and off all the time, but infrequently and at the very extremes. And of course, I'm not a psychologist and my doctors and others could explain this better, but your mind doesn't like that too much. Another thing that happens is in wild and fire, it's a, it's a seasonal position. Now the fire season's not seasonal. D don't mishear me there. And I want the, your audience to make sure they understand that the fire season's year round. There's, there's no going back. We will always yeah. now from this point forward across Very the true. globe, have a fire season. I've, I've been on more fires on Christmas Eve than I have on the 4th of July. How's that? I mean, good to know. Destructive fires, destructive fires. That, that's factual. That's factual. Um, so, so the, the point is, is unfortunately, the profession is still oriented towards the seasonal work. So, oftentimes, is a hotshot, a smoke jumper, a hell attack, uh, a, a fire uh, engine captain or crew member. You're employed for six, nine months of the year in this running and gunning environment. And then guess what happens? Just like with, with our military veterans, they come home from the battle theater, the wildfire theater, and guess what? It's just normal life. And, and that's it's, hard to adapt to. It's, it's impossible to adapt without help. It really is. Yeah. 
and and you know segueing into the warriors on the river i i struggled you know admittedly and it would it's taken me 27 years to admit uh uh to myself and to you that i did but once i was able to realize that i also realized that i'm in a position to help others too and so with warriors you know we're not counselors we're not doctors we're not psychologists but what we are are first responders who want to help other first responders reset themselves and the water was a solution for me fly fishing being in nature uh, for others it could be mountain biking it could be you know it could be knitting it really doesn't matter as long as it doesn't involve drugs or drinking right that's that's what we don't want because those are yeah. the fallbacks for our community right uh, Absolutely. You know, and so we we don't we don't allow any of that but what we do is get the first responders out on the river show them how to fly fish if they don't like it it doesn't even matter because it's about standing in the water and talking and then connecting them with the right resources. So in other words, if they feel like, you know, they might need some family counseling or they might need some personal counseling, we have those resources for them to connect to. Um, and, and that's important because there, our culture is on the verge of change in that regards. But, you know, when I grew up in this field, uh, there was no talk about PTSD and after action reviews and, you know, things that could help us process these post post incident. Today, yeah. we're, we're doing a better job at that, but it, it's still not happening as much as it should. No, and I mean, it's funny, not funny, but when you say uh, standing in nature, stand, you know, fly fishing, nature is so important just for our own human psyche. Um, People, we're surrounded by chaos every day. If you live in a city, you've got noise, you've got people, you've got cars, just constant noise. And I actually have a friend who started a forest bathing therapy group in Michigan. And she takes people into the forest and she's like, chill out. You know, you've, you've, you've done a lot today. Now is your time to just decompress. And we've forgotten how to do that because we're constantly on the hustle. We're constantly on the run. We're constantly doing our jobs. So taking your people who do have extraordinary stress and anxiety. I mean, a lot of it, I would assume from people saying, my house burned down, my stuff is gone. Why didn't you save it? I hate to break it to you guys. They're here to save lives and people and your family, not your stuff. Yeah. It's stuff. Let it go. Have less stuff. You know, Lord knows. Enough <laughs> use less. Yep. That's, that's, a, that's a sustainability thing right there. Buy less stuff. But it's about your you and your, your ability to just know what's right for you, know what's good for you, and reconnect with nature if you can, because that's going to bring you back to center. Um, nothing else will. So sorry to go on that little tangent, but I, I got to say, it's it's so important to reconnect with that, of what's important in your world. Well, and, and for wildfire, you know, extension of that is it's about the environment too. You know, yeah. that's that's the connection for me is originally was protecting the forest and, and the, the biodiversity of the forest and those ecosystems which are now intertwined with the WUI, the Wildland and Urban Interface, which now is just all one environment, right? And so we are part of nature and we need to protect it, but we also need to find it for a safe space, in my opinion. And it sounds like you agree. And, and I would encourage I would encourage others to, to seek that, that refuge too. Oh, yeah. I think it's, I mean, even when you're in a city, I mean, I've lived in New York and Boston, there were parks and I would just go in yeah. and just kind of tune out the noise if I, as yeah. best as I could. And it would it would just kind of recenter your focus a little bit and drown out that noise because that's necessary. So Jay, on that, I'm gonna thank you for the work in XPRIZE. And guys, please check out XPRIZE Foundation. The work they are doing is very important. It's not just wildfire. They have many, many different departments. Today, we are focusing on new technology for wildfire, um, not just prevention, but response, those 10 minutes. 10 minutes mean everything. So if you've got an idea, go to X prize. That's X P R I Z E. Just find the right format, fill it in, join them or contact Jay. He's on LinkedIn. Hopefully you don't mind me saying that Jay. <laughs> no, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Xprize.org backslash wildfire for us. Yeah. It's, and it, it, they're doing good things because we do need to address these mega fires that are, you know, fire tornadoes. Who knew that was a thing <laughs> until now? <laughs> Right. These are getting things are getting serious. We need to start responding in a serious manner. Um, but also, I would really love to talk about, you know, the Warriors on the River. That's W-O-R-F-I-S-H dot org. 
Yes. Please, if you need that service, if you need that help, reach out to the organization. You need just recentering is okay. It's okay to say, I'm not okay. That's the most important message out there is not everyone's got it 100%. And faking it isn't going to work long term. So just reach out to this, these groups, get the help you need, benefits everybody in the long run, your family, your society, your people, your neighbors. And um, so yeah, Jay, I, I'm really, really grateful to know you. <laughs> Well, thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about myself and XPRIZE and, and the work we do. To your point, you know, this competition could be a game changer for humanity. Always. There's no promises here, but um, whatever happens out of these two tracks of competition, it's only going to be good. You know, it's only going to be good. And the partners mm -hmm. we have are incredible. Um, the Moore Foundation, the Mindaroo Foundation, PG&E, um, Lockheed Martin, Oh, wow. um, so, you know, there's a, there's a host of just um, diverse entities that are interested in this problem and solving it in a way that they could just sit back and, you know, help. And, and yeah. that's important. Nobody has an agenda other than solve the problem. And that I think innovators value because of the safe space. Um, the last thing I'll add is with the competition is, um, you know, we do a lot of team matchmaking. So even if you feel like you have a good idea, but don't have the resources or you don't have a piece of the puzzle, we bring innovators together throughout the competition. I mean, all the way up to the last day, we'll bring innovators together and allow them to reformulate their team and recreate their ideas because we don't want to stifle innovation. So don't get discouraged if you're not a computer programmer or a a UAS okay. drone operator or anything like that. Um, if you got a good idea, look into it. I love that. And the collaboration is, that's what really takes things to the home plate. Let's be real. Yes. You're not going to have all the pieces yourself. You've got to have a wide network of people contributing. So loving, loving XPRIZE. Um, so Jay, thank you so much for your time today. Really grateful. And um, guys, please check out Jay Stalnacker. He's on LinkedIn. Check out um, uh, the wildfire, um, sorry xprize foundation or dot org wildfire and we will see you guys next time when we your host wendy nystrom environmental social justice you guys have a great day take care